My, Michael Behe, the biochemist at Lehigh University, wrote a book called Darwin's Black Box. And in this bu bu book, he points out how Darwin showed that if you could prove that there was some form of life that was irreducibly complex, then evolution, as an origin especially, falls apart. And Michael Behe's point is, there is so much complexity to a sim simple living cell. It's irreducibly complex. And the analogy he uses is very helpful. He uses the analogy of a mousetrap. A mousetrap does not work if it is just a slab of wood. A mousetrap does not work and catch mice if it's just a slab of wood and a hammer. A mousetrap has to have the slab of wood, the hammer, and the spring in order to catch mice, in order to continue on. And so Michael Behe's point is rather simple. A single living cell is irreducibly complex. It can't move from one simple stage to the next stage to the next stage and then all of a sudden become a living cell. It's either a living cell or it's not. And it needs all of its components in order to be a living cell. So the complexity of a single living cell demands some type of creator. You're talking about the meaningless of life mm -hmm. uh, coming from atheists, and you kind of reduce it to how uh, you can choose broccoli or macaroni one day. Mm -hmm. um, some atheists would consider that insulting because we can find different meanings in life. You don't have to invest in one person. As you say, you can invest in an ideal. Similar to Christianity, you invest your you find your meaning your meaningfulness in life through Jesus. What about other idols? I believe Jesus was a good role model. I could follow his ideal. What about Gandhi? What about Buddha? It doesn't necessarily have to be one person, but more of an ideal. The, the question I was seeking to answer was, what is the evidence that God exists? That God, not Jesus, okay. that God exists. In other words, some type of supernatural being, some type of eternal being. And my point was, if there is no eternal being, then obviously meaning demands a mind and meaning is something that we create in our heads. Following me so far? Okay. Which means, if I in my head say, the meaning of my life is to feed this man, to love this man, that's cool, but I could just as equally say, the meaning of my life is to murder him and to steal from him. One is not right, the other's not wrong, because meaning comes from right here. And if right here says today, the meaning of my life is to respect and love him, that's cool. But if tomorrow I say, the meaning of my life is to steal from him and murder him, that's equally cool. Because there is no ultimate meaning to life, because there's no eternal being who created us for a purpose. We just happened. And we're the first minds. And it takes a mind to define meaning. And therefore, if I create my meaning as to love him, that's cool. And if I create my meaning to hate him, that's equally cool. And you see, then when you think about that seriously, you begin to realize, well, it doesn't really matter whether I love him or murder him. It's just my meaning. It's what I create. That's what Nietzsche and Camus and Sartre point out is the reason that life is ultimately meaningless because it really doesn't matter what you decide your meaning is. Whatever you choose, go ahead. Does that make any sense? Yeah, that makes sense. But I mean, I don't believe a human has such a consistency to say, I'm going to wake up and love him one day, and I'm going to wake up and murder him one day. Okay. It's an ideal one chooses to believe throughout life. And they, I would like to believe they stick to some moral code or some idealism. They don't flip flop every day. I don't, under, I don't understand the argument where, I don't know, the way you make it seem is just if you don't have a fundamental base in a higher moral being, then you're saying that person can go either way each day. All right. The point is, if there is no higher being, no God, then you and I create our meaning. And if part of our meaning is to be consistent, fine, be consistent. Hitler was pretty consistent. 
Idi Amin was pretty consistent. Gandhi was pretty consistent. Mother Teresa was pretty consistent. But you see, the point is, it's relative. It really doesn't matter whether you choose to be Adolf Hitler the second or Mother Teresa the second. It's your choice. You create your own meaning. If there is no creator, you create it. You are the creator. You're God, in a sense. Okay. What, are you saying there's, uh, I guess, not as much fun? I mean, how can I say? Um, are you deducing if you create your own meaning, as opposed to if you get it from higher power? No, I'm saying that we have two options that I know of. Yeah. Either there is a creator who makes us for a purpose, which means there can be ultimate meaning in life, or else there is no creator, no God. Our number came up in a Monte Carlo game. We evolved by chance. We're here and we create our own meaning. So if I create my own meaning and you create your own meaning, and if we contradict each other, there's no problem because you've created your own meaning and I've created my own meaning. Ultimately, objectively, there's no real meaning to life. It's simply what you choose to create, what I choose to create. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes, sorry, I, I don't want to confuse you. Um, so I can create my own meaning, but you get your meaning from, I guess, God, right? And your meaning would come from the Word of God, which would be the Bible, right? Well, we're not there yet, okay? We're simply, we're simply at the initial stage, which is, do you, from your observation of life, think that there is a real purpose to human existence, or do you think there is no purpose to human existence? Life is ultimately meaningless. See, now, my point is, as I observe human beings, although many human beings like to say to me, well, there is no God, and life is ultimately meaningless, they can't live it out. Yeah, I agree. That's they a cannot live it out. And so what's that called? That's called intellectual hypocrisy. If I say I believe something, but I cannot live it out, I'm a hypocrite. The same way if I say, I believe in Jesus, and then you watch me go out and womanize. You have a word for me. Hypocrite, Cliff. You say, with your mind, you believe in Jesus. But the way you live your life is, you contradict him. You're a hypocrite. And so my simple point is, if you say that life is meaningless, but then you live your life as if life has real meaning, real meaning, not just arbitrary, aren't you an intellectual hypocrite? Can't you have meaning without uh, Yes. God? You can have meaning without God, but you've got to remember, it's not ultimate. It's just a prejudice. It's, it's, you've created it in your head. And if you had chosen to create the opposite, of whatever it is the meaning of your life is, that would be equally valid. Okay. Let's say that you've created in your head, the purpose of my life is to love people. Great. But if there is no ultimate meaning to life, what you're having to acknowledge is, if I say the meaning of my life is to hate people instead of to love them, that's just as legitimate. Right? Legitimate, I mean, that calls into call, um, question, question the morality of it, but that's another topic. Yeah, that, exactly. That's another topic that we get right into, which is, if there is no God, there's no moral lawgiver, which means you make up the laws, I make up the laws, or the government makes up the laws, or the power elite make up the laws, but it's all relative. Okay. I mean, yes, it would be relative, but um, you're saying earlier if you were to hit someone and they would be all right with that. I would have to disagree with that because if you hit someone, of course, both may have uh, relative morals, but you're not just going to say, oh, if that's okay with you, it's okay with me. Of course, you're going to disagree with them right. and you're going to try and educate them why you, you think it's wrong right and that's where i guess of course moral morality is going to clash between everyone mm -hmm. and to say that you get your morality based on a on scripture is to, I, I i usually take it as that's a sign of superiority if you get your sign from the word of god as opposed to you kind of Picking and choosing the morality, totally on the five, God life. Okay, if I eat my children, yeah. what are you going to say to me? That's wrong. What do you mean when you say that's wrong? Because you're taking life and you're taking the liberty from the children. So what? If morality is relative, okay. and if I eat my children, what do you say to me? You say, I'm wrong. Yeah. Well, that's from your perspective. True. And remember, if morality is relative, right and wrong are simply a perspective. 
they're not ultimately right or ultimately wrong. It's just a bias, a taste, a perspective. Why would you eat your children? Because I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just as arbitrary as you're hungry. Yeah. There's no meaning behind it. Well, I'm hungry and I want to sustain my life, so I'm going to eat my children. Because they taste good. So, <laughs> so there's no like there's no value in life besides sustenance. Exactly. Why does life have value if we're simply pond scum evolved to a higher order? We're not pond scum. Okay, what are we? We're we evolved yes over millions of years, and we we get we have consciousness. So we grew up to live and love one another. You don't necessarily need like a high power to tell you that. I mean, it's you kind of learn that growing up. Yeah, but but if there is no God. Meaning by that, there is no being that created matter and energy. If there is no God, no being that created matter and energy, then obviously we come from matter and energy. So you like to use the word love. Come on, man. If there is no God, you know what love is. It's a chemical reaction. That's all it is. It's a drive to, to preserve the genetic pool. It's a sex drive. That's all it is. It's not this free decision to actually care for somebody, right? Keep going, I like you, you're okay. doing well. Uh, <laughs> you say it's a sex drive, I mean, what about uh, romance or whatever? Just because I would love somebody else doesn't mean it's a sex drive. It, it could be like for connection, human connection. Oh, come on. If all of reality comes from matter and energy, you know what romance is. Your sex glands have been excited. Yeah, love, I mean, love that extends beyond um, sexual. Love, yeah, what is love beyond problem. sex? What is love beyond a drive to preserve the genetic pool, to keep my children, my babies alive, to preserve the genetic pool? There's familial love. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know there's love. But you see, if there is no God, what we're saying is reality is matter and energy evolved to a higher order. So what is love? See, if you say there is no God, you're automatically reducing reality to matter and energy. You're a materialist, aren't you? Which means love is simply a biochemical reaction. Isn't it? Well, I mean, what more is, what more is there to reality if all of ma reality is matter and energy? You've got matter and energy mixing in my brain in such a way that I feel drawn to you but in reality what's going on is i want to preserve the genetic pool so i want you to live i don't well i don't think that's necessarily going to your mind uh, when a lot of people choose to love it's not they want to <coughs> preserve the genetic pool very good i agree with you so you just look at the way you live your life you look at the way you experience life which is baloney i know there's something more to love than just to drive to preserve the genetic pool just a sex drive what is it? I think that every single one of us, every atheist, every agnostic, every theist, has the ability, the genuine ability, to really care for another person. But you see, the atheist, or the materialist, or the naturalist, is in a jam. Because they're reducing reality to matter and energy, but their experience tells them, oh no, 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 there's more to my experience than matter and energy. I have a free will. I can genuinely care for someone, or I can smack them. And I don't have to do either. Does that make any sense? Kind of. Okay, I, what, where's the breakdown? I just have the issue when you reduce something to matter and energy, because when you reduce it to that, of course there's something to be wrong with it, because it's so simple. Love is not simple. Okay. So, sorry, what was the argument? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, matter is real. Obviously, energy is real. The question you and I are trying to think through is, is God real? Now, I can't see God, and I can't feel God's energy. So I was trying to answer the question, well then, Cliff, if you can't see God, if God isn't material, and if God is not an energy that you can feel pushing you, then why would you, as a thinking human being, believe that God exists? And one of my pieces of evidence for God's existence is our, not my, just my, our experience of love. 
Now, what is love? I would argue that your experience and my experience teach us that there is more to love than just matter and energy. We have a free will, which is why when your girlfriend says, I love you, you get excited. But if your dad calls you up tonight and says, I've been paying her a thousand bucks a week to date you and love you, you'd be distraught. You'd be bummed out. Why? Because love in order to be real must be free. If it ain't free, it ain't love. So what is love? It's this free decision to care for somebody, to put your interests before my own, to really be concerned about you. And every atheist friend of mine loves. But you see, that love that they're experiencing should tell them that there's more to reality than matter and energy. Now, my MIT atheist friend says this. He says, Cliff, you're right. All of reality, because I believe there is no God, is just matter and energy. But we are such complex combinations of matter and energy that we just have this ability to love. I say, fine, please explain it to me. And this brilliant MIT grad says, well, I can't explain it biochemically or physically, but it's obvious that we experience it, and therefore I, because I don't allow for the existence of God, have to conclude that somehow, in a way that we will discover at some point, matter and energy come together in such a way that we have this ability to love. And I say, wow. <laughs> That's fascinating. You know, somehow, some way, some day, we're going to figure out how matter and energy come together in such a way that we have free will and this ability to love. I think that breaks down philosophically. Does that make any sense? Uh, that makes a little sense. Uh, okay, I mean, I'm going to stick around for all that. All right, man. Thank you so much for raising those issues. To say that evil can only be real if there's some type of God, yeah. the concept of evil may be in that wording, but there's still ways to hurt people and to step on people mm -hmm. and all those things, and maybe they wouldn't be considered evil if there wasn't considered an absolute good or there wasn't a belief in God, but they would still be things that harmed other people, and they would still be things that were frowned upon because they harmed other people. And, okay, sure. uh, and Martin Luther King as well. You said that, you know, he was like, there absolutely is this. But Martin Luther King believed there absolutely was because he was a Christian. The people he was trying to appeal to believed there absolutely was because they were Christian. So he was able to consider it absolute. But, you know, like speaking to somebody who doesn't consider it absolute, it's not going to have the same sway. You're going to need a more, or a different argument. There's still an argument to be made for it, sure. But it's, you're not going to be able to say, oh, well, the Bible says this is absolutely true. And since we both accept that it must be true, we can have that. It's just an effective technique given the circumstances. When I am dialoguing with my Muslim friends, the issue that you and I are talking about is a moot point. Because my Muslim friends understand there is a God. And because there is a God, there's an objective right and an objective wrong. See, the only reason we're having this discussion right now is because you're saying, wait a second, there, doesn't, there is no God. And I'm trying to say, wait a second, my Muslim friends, my Buddhist friends, my Hindu friends, my Confucius friends, they understand that because there is some type of God, there are objective morals. So we don't, with my Muslim friends, they're intellectually consistent. But you see, sir, if you're going to be an atheist, fine, I respect, I'll fight for your right to be an atheist. But I'm going to try and hold you to be intellectually consistent and to acknowledge that because there is no God, morality is a crapshoot. It's a crapshoot. That's all it is. Well, I mean, you can say it's a crapshoot. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's no absolute, right. understandably. We agree that I think that there's not and that you think there is. And your Muslim friends are also going to be, agree on an absolute truth that is built upon those ideas that a civilization will best thrive on. No, conditions. false. The Muslim believers understanding that there's an objective right and wrong is based on an understanding that there is a moral lawgiver, God. And that is where the Muslim and I agree 100%. And I respect that. But intellectually, I have a hard time respecting an atheist or a secularist who says, there is no God, but there are objective morals. I didn't say there are. I know. You're, you're doing a good job, I think. 
Yeah. You're being consistent. You're saying, Cliff, you're right. Because there is no God in my worldview, yeah. therefore, right and wrong are totally relative. They're totally arbitrary. Yes. But now, see, my point to you is I don't think you can live that out. I mean, it might not be practical to live it out, but there's a Good. difference between what I believe to be true and what I believe to be practical. And I think it's important to be intellectually honest and discuss that. Good. And if I say to you, I have put my faith in Jesus Christ, but I do not think it is practical for me to be faithful to my wife. Therefore, I'm going to have sex with as many good-looking women as I can. What would you say to me? All right, I'm going to counter that instead of instead of well, fighting. Answer it. Okay, no, I want to give you a back example to prove when it would be a, an example when you might go against what you objectively believe to be true. Uh -huh. Let's say that a battered woman comes into your house, looks freaked out, you let her in, you tell her she can stay for a while. Then you see her, you know, early looking husband or boyfriend come up, says, have you seen my wife? What do you say back? Are you going to stick to thou shalt not lie, or are you going to try and handle it in the way that makes the most intellectual, practical sense? That is a fantastic question. But why is it a fantastic question? It's a fantastic question because you know human beings have innate worth. And so you're waiting for my answer, which is going to tell you either that I devalue that battered woman or I value it. See, you're making the same intellectual mistake that the atheistic professor makes when he says the following. You're involved in a ship going down. There are six of you swimming around in the water. There's only room on the life raft for five of you. Okay. What are you going to do? Well, and all the Christian students in the, in the class go, ah, I don't know. And the atheist professor stands there and just milks that one. See you guys? Morality is relative. How are you going to make that decision? Six of you swimming in the water, one life raft only fits five. If the sixth gets in, the life raft goes down. But you see, here's the dishonesty of the professor. The dishonesty of the professor is the only reason that that is an ethical dilemma is if you assume that human life is valuable. That's one whale of a big assumption, my friends. If your pond scum evolved to a higher order, then it really doesn't matter what you do. Just save your life. Okay. But the reason that that is such an ethical dilemma is because down deep you know that human life is valuable, therefore you have an ethical dilemma. You only got five seats in the life raft, you got six people. So what are we going to do? In the midst of change, in the midst of tr the trauma of transition, remember, wait upon God. What does it mean to wait upon God? To wait upon God means to remember who God is, what God is like, to remember his faithfulness, to remember his power, to remember that he's eternal, to remember that he does not change, to remember that he's faithful, to remember that he is always gracious. Remember God. Be silent. Be quiet. Shh. And remember that he is God. Also, remember that he's a God who works, who's not aloof, who's not distant, but who is always present. That's why Paul writes in Romans 8.28, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Paul rests in the confidence that regardless of the change, regardless of the pain, regardless of the transition, regardless of the empty nest, regardless of even the divorce, regardless of the cancer or the upcoming impending death, God is with you, God is at work. And that produces tremendous peace, tremendous confidence. Think about Noah. Noah was told by God to make an ark. Noah didn't understand exactly what that meant. Noah had never seen a flood of that magnitude. And yet Noah waited upon God, trusted in God, found his contentment in God. To wait upon God means to trust God for contentment. Contentment is the ability to thank God for all the gifts that he has given you and to rest in Him. And that is exactly what Paul expresses in Philippians 4, 11 to 13. He writes, I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or living in want, whether living in plenty. I have learned to be content in every situation. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That is what it means to wait upon God, to trust Him, 
to be at work, to be with us, regardless of the changes, the transitions that we're going through. The actor, Jimmy Stewart, signed up for the Army Air Corps and left for World War II. His father, Alex, tried to communicate his love for him, his concern for him, but words failed him. And so just before Jimmy Stewart left, his dad, Alex, handed him a note. And Jimmy Stewart read that note. The note was a conviction that Psalm 91 spoke the truth. And Psalm 91 begins with the words, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And as Jimmy Stewart was flying over to fight in World War II in Europe, he opened up the note from his father, Alex, and the note read, My dear Jim Boy, soon after you read this letter, you will be on your way to the worst sort of danger. Jim, I'm banking on the enclosed copy of Psalm 91. The thing that takes the place of fear and worry is the promise of these words. I am staking my faith in these words. I feel sure that God will lead you through this mad experience. I can say no more. I only continue to pray. Goodbye, my dear. God bless you and keep you. I love you more than I can tell you, Dad. As Jimmy Stewart led his squadron through 20 successful campaigns, he held tightly to Psalm 91. He held tightly to the words, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. That is what it means to wait upon God. That is where courage, spiritual muscle, contentment come from, from trusting in God, trusting in Jesus Christ, obeying Him, being committed to Him, understanding that He is with you wherever you go and that He's at work, whatever the change, whatever the transition is. But you need to trust in Christ. I need to trust in Him. You can make that decision now, simply but profoundly. Ask Christ to forgive you for your wrongdoing. Put your faith in Him. Commit your life to Him. And He promises to forgive you. He promises to give you the gift of eternal life. And He promises to put His Holy Spirit in you. In other words, He's promising to go with you through whatever change, whatever transition you're facing. Wait upon Him. Find your contentment in Him. Trust in Him. Rest in Him. I'm the pastor of Grace Community Church. We meet every Sunday morning at 9.30 at Sachs Middle School in New Canaan, Connecticut. Take the Merritt Parkway to exit 37, go to the end of the ramp, take a left onto Route 124, go approximately one mile and take a right into Sachs Middle School. I'd love to invite you personally to join us this Sunday, 9.30 for our worship service. Have a great day.